my great pleasure to introduce you, the, the, to everyone, uh, the first speaker of this education series, so Dr. Uh, Bill Lemon. So Bill is a senior scientist at the Geninia Research Campus with expertise in live image application by using light sheet microscopes. Before joining Geninia, he works as a research scientist at the University of California, Berkeley, and then at the National Institute of Health. He received his bachelor degree from the University of California, Irvine, and a PhD degree from Texas. He got his postdoc training at the University of Arizona and the University of California, Berkeley. His research interest lies in interrogating the development of the embryonic nervous system of flies, fish, and mice using cutting edge optical methods. He has produced widely known videos of how the Zosophila embryo develops at the earliest stage in vivo. Please join me in welcome Bill to start his talk. Please, uh, please note, so this talk will divide it into two sections. For the presentation section, please mute yourself and then we will start discussion in the second section, in the Q&A section. Yeah, Bill, uh, yeah, you can take over. Okay, hello everybody. Um, so today I'm gonna to introduce you to the SimView microscope. SimView stands for Simultaneous Multi-View Light Sheet Microscopy, which uh, we use for live imaging of samples because you know that's what's most interesting. We wanna image biological processes. And if you wanna uh, you know, make a movie of a biological processes. You have a lot of microscopes to choose from. Um, and this, I just walked around and took pictures of microscopes in labs near me. And um, so there are a lot of choices. How do you choose? What's the best microscope? Well, for live imaging, there's several things you have to keep in, in, uh, in mind. Um, you're imaging a biological process in a living organism. Um, you want to make a good movie of tiny things, and you don't want to damage the specimen. Um, because, in, at least in my case, what you want to do is image kind of the natural process, the, you know, the physiological processes that are going on. Um, some examples are development, neural activity, cell signaling, immune function. I, I will only talk about development and neural activity today, but we have done... Uh, imaging on the other topics as well. So um, starting with the simplest microscope, um, we use a binocular microscope, you know, take a nice picture of the outside of something. Um, it's uh, some, some uh, good advantages of the binocular microscope are that uh, it's fast, it's wide field image capture. You capture the whole image all at once in just one, one, uh, one exposure. And uh, sample prep is, is typically very simple. Just stick the thing underneath the microscope and take pictures. The disadvantages are there's no 3D information. And you're seeing the whole thickness of the sample all at once. Uh, it's hard to tell the top from the bottom, especially if your sample has any transparency to it and you're limited to low magnification. You could use a compound microscope, um, which everybody's I'm sure familiar with or remember this beast from high school. And the way this microscope works is that there's a light source below the sample. Um, it's focused onto the, um, hang on a second. It's, it's focused onto the slide that holds your sample and the light passes through the sample to your objective lens and then up to your eye or a camera. Um, so what you're seeing is the whole sample all at once, the full thickness. So that's, it's good because it's fast. It's bad because the contrast is quite low um, in an, 
if you put like a, this is a paramecium, single cell organism, just, um, oh, I'm sorry, an amoeba, um, single cell organism on a, on a slide. And um, what you're relying on is scattering or absorption of, of the light uh, before it gets to your detector. And uh, so contrast can be quite low. There are some things you can do to increase the contrast, some um, tricks you can play with the optics. This is a, the same specimen imaged with diff uh, differential interference contrast. Um, so you get a little more contrast in the image. Um, but typically the contrast is not great. There's another technique called phase contrast where you can get, uh, again, you're just playing with the, the light path and you can increase the, the contrast a little bit. But typically the contrast is not great, um, but uh, it is fast. It's a wide field image capture. You're imaging the whole specimen all at once. Uh, this, the sample prep can be fairly simple. Um, you can just put something on a slide, smear it on there and take an image. Uh, the disadvantages, of course, are, like I said, low contrast. And you have no 3D information. You're looking at the full thickness of the specimen all at once. It may not all be in focus, but you're seeing information through the full thickness of the specimen. Uh, another way to image a live specimen is with epifluorescence microscopy. Um, and this is mainly a way to increase the the contrast in your specimen. The way that um, every fluorescence works is you have a light source here that um, you filter the light so that you uh, get just a single wavelength or a very narrow band of, of wavelengths that are directed down through the, the objective of your microscope to a fluorescently labeled cell that excites the fluorophores in your fluorescently labeled cells. I'll talk more about this in a minute. And then the, the emitted light from your sample passes back up through the same objective through a dichroic mirror, which instead of bouncing the light back to the light source, lets the longer wavelength emitted light pass through to a detector. Um, and so what this does is it separates the wavelengths that you're you're illuminating your sample with and the wavelengths that you're detecting. So a typical fluorescent label, a commonly used one is green fluorescent protein. And um, like all fluorescent labels, it's excited, it can be excited and uh, imaged at two different wavelengths. So the light that, it, that excites this fluorophore is a shorter wavelength light, in this case about centered around 488 nanometers, and the light that it's emit, is emitted is longer. So if you, you choose the filters correctly, you can block all of the illumination light. So you get rid of all the scattered and reflected light from your sample and only detect the light that is emitted by the fluorophores that you've intentionally put into your sample. So what you end up getting is a fluorescent image like this. this. These are the same samples with the DIC phase contrast and the fluorescent label. And in the fluorescent label, you see this much higher contrast. There are some things that are labeled with, the, with these fluorescent labels and some things that are not. And the things that aren't labeled are dark. There's no, you don't have to worry about scattered light uh, screwing up your image. And there are lots of choices for uh, fluorescent labels. You can use fluorescent proteins. Um, uh, I use a lot of genetically encoded fluorescent proteins like green fluorescent protein um, that has been genetically engineered into the organism ahead of time. You can use antibodies um, that uh, bind to specific targets in your, in your sample and the advantage of the antibodies is that they can be, uh, you can have your signal amplified um, because the sec you can have uh, fluorescent labeled secondary antibodies that 
uh, you get a lot more uh, flor fluorophores, many more fluorophores on each uh, labeled protein. So you get a, a brighter signal. And you have a lot of different wavelengths to choose from. So you can make, you can have multiple colors in there with uh, each one uh, uh, labeling a different target protein or target in your in your sample. So you get you can get really nice multi-color images. Like this is a a picture of a, a cultured neuron in green and cultured glial, glial cells in red, and uh, it's really easy to see the morphology of both cells, both cell types, and uh, to distinguish them with very little uh, scattered light and high contrast. So epifluorescence microscopy is great because it has, uh, again, fast wide field image capture. You're imaging the whole specimen all at once, um, high contrast. You still don't have any 3D information. Again, you're imaging the entire thickness of the specimen all at once. And there's a, with any fluorescent imaging technique, there's a risk of photo damage and phototoxicity. I'll talk more about this in, in a bit. Um, you can also choose a confocal microscope. This is the workhorse of the research laboratory. Um, I'm sure probably all of you have used a confocal microscope. Um, it works much like an epifluorescence microscope, except the light source is a laser. And the laser is directed by a dichroic mirror to a single pixel on your specimen. Um, and the objective focuses it to, um, to one plane in your, your specimen. So you can uh, kind of brightly illuminate like a single 3D spot, one voxel in your specimen. And that voxel, if it has a fluorescent label, will emit a fluorescent, uh, some fluorescent light of a longer wavelength, which again gets separated by these a dichroic mirror. So it doesn't get reflected back to the light source, but goes up to a photo detector. The magic of the confocal microscope is the confocal pinhole. What the confocal pinhole does is it uh, provides a very narrow path for only the best focused light to pass through. Anything that's out of focus, any light that comes from a plane above or below the focal plane of your objective gets blocked by this confocal pinhole. So all the light that reaches the photo detector is perfectly in focus. This gives you the ability to do optical sectioning. So you only image a single plane of your specimen. All the light that's above, that's all the fluorescent light that's above or below that plane gets blocked. So it can really increase the, the sharpness of your image. So here's the same specimen with image with wide, wide field uh, detection and with confocal detection. And you see that the below the confocal part of this image that everything is in nice crisp focus. And here's a very Janelia kind of image. This is the brain of, uh, Drosophila, an adult Drosophila. The magenta is uh, a neuropill, an antibody against uh, a neuropill or a synaptic protein called Bruchpilot. Um, and the green is a, a population of neurons that express the gene atonal. Um, and what you're looking at is just the confocal stack. So these are the individual optical sections. Each one is in perfect focus, and you can stack stack them all together to make uh, a, a nice three D image. We use these all the time at con in uh, Genelia. Um, here's some other con nice confocal, multicolor confocal images. These are hair cells from uh, the human inner ear, um, and you can see in green the hair cells. The blue are the nuclei, and the red are the neurons that are associated with air cells. And this is a, another uh, fruit fly brain. This is this part of the central body of the fruit fly brain with a uh, population of neurons, each individual 
individually labeled with a different color. They make get really nice pictures with these confocal microscopes. The problem with the confocal microscope is the photo bleaching. So just a refresher about fluorescence microscopy or fluorescence um, and how it's used in microscopy is you shine a light at your specimen, your fluorescently labeled specimen, some, um, some photons are absorbed, a photon is absorbed. And then eventually, you know, in a very short period of time, microseconds later, um, the, the, uh, oh, the, so the electron that's absorbed this, this photon, it's excited to a higher uh, orbital layer level, and then it relaxes back to its original uh, energy level and emits a photon of light with a longer wavelength. Um, in some in some labels, there can be this intersystem crossing where uh, the uh, electron can settle into a more stable triplet state, triplet state, and uh, will release a, a longer, even longer wavelength of light uh, very much later. So this is this this can be delayed, uh, you know, seconds, minutes, hours later. But the fluorescence is what we're interested in. And so you absorb a short wavelength of light and then a longer wavelength, a lower energy uh, photon is emitted. So some energy is lost in this, um, in this transition. Where does that energy go? Well, it can go to a number of different places. And one of the places it goes is it's lost as, um, um, as heat, which can cook your specimen, or it can, um, can cause electrons to be lost from the chromophore altogether, the fluorophore altogether. And when that happens, the, the fluorophore will like lose an electron and um, be the change its conformation and it just becomes dark. And so it can no longer be excited. It can no longer fluoresce. So over time, what you see here is just repeated confocal images of the same specimen and it loses its fluorescence. So photo bleaching is something that's going to happen to your fluorescently labeled uh, specimen. It's just a matter of time. And the only way to prevent it is to use less light. You know, don't put as, don't excite these floor forces as much. Don't uh, elicit as many fluorescent um, protein or fluorescent photons. You just have to limit your photon budget. Another problem is phototoxicity, that some of that energy that's lost in that transition from, from excitation to uh, emission um, can produce singlet oxygen species, these redact reactive uh, ox oxygen species, peroxides, that not only do they, um, is that energy lost, but it's energy that ends up uh, creating these basically toxins that are going to interact with pr proteins, lipids, nucleic acids in your in the cells that you're imaging, and uh, they cause cross-linking, and they can end up killing cells. So here is an image of of two cells. The the one on the bottom has is a normal-looking cell. The one on the top here has been illuminated um, for, for, about, uh, for several hours. And uh, what you see are these big out pockets of, um, of, the, of cytoplasm. So these are blebs in the surface of the, of the cell that uh, were caused by breakdown of the cytoskeleton. So this is a cytoskeleton label and phototoxicity has 
kind of broken down the whole cytoskeleton and cells come apart. And on the right here, what you see are two images of one area of one area in a cell culture that has not been illuminated is just a single confocal image. And then one of a different area in the same cell culture that's been illuminated for a few hours and then had this confocal image. And what you see is that a lot of the cells are missing their label. And more importantly, on the, the bottom here, um, here's a densely populated part of a cell culture that's not been illuminated. And on the right, the area that has been illuminated for a few hours before this image was taken, and the cells are just missing. So the, the illumination has killed a bunch of the cells here in the center of this image. So a confocal microscope is great because everything is in focus. You get excellent 3D information. The disadvantages are that it's very slow. It's point scanning. You have to scan every point in a plane, then move to the next plane in your specimen, scan every point again, and um, repeat until you get through the whole thickness of your specimen. And you have a big problem with photo bleaching and phototoxicity because this light, this illumination light that's passing through your specimen when you illuminate it, passes through the entire specimen. Even though you're only interested in a single plane, you're only imaging a single plane at one time, the laser light is passing through the entire specimen. So if you have 100 planes in your specimen, you have to illuminate each, each, uh, each voxel in that whole image 100 times to get one image. So there's 100 times more, you're using 100 times more light than you really need to. So photo bleaching and phototoxicity can be a big problem. Um, one way to fix that is with a multi-photon microscope. So what are the, um, one of the advantages of multi-photon mic microscope is that it uses a longer wavelength of laser light with lower energy. And um, instead of illuminating and uh, exciting fluorophores through the entire thickness of your specimen like you do with a, a confocal one photon excitation. With, with multi-photon excitation, um, only at the, the narrowest point of focus is there enough energy uh, and the photons are dense enough to get the fluorophore to absorb two of these longer wavelength, lower energy photons at the same time and then you get excitation of the fluorophore. Above that and below that, the energy isn't dense enough to uh, elicit um, uh, excitation of the, of the fluorophore. So you get just a very small single um, spot in, in X, Y, Z space that is illuminated. And you can see over here, on um, these actual images of one photon and two photon excitation, that in the, the area of, fo of excitation is very, very small. It was so small I had to draw a circle around it so you could see it. You can see it a little better in the inset on the right. So you're only exciting the, the, the fluorophores in a very small area, um, not exciting every, anything above or below. So you really reduce the photo bleaching. So every multi-photon microscope, it works. It's a point scanning microscope, just like the, the confocal. So everything is in focus. You have excellent 3D information. And you also get deep tissue penetration because you're using this long wavelength light that doesn't scatter as much as the shorter wavelength light. It's still slow. It's a point scanning technique. Um, it's a little faster because you're, you get a little better uh, photon capture because you don't have, you don't have to pass your light through a pinhole on the way back to the detector. Uh, so it's a little faster, um, but you also have the disadvantage of heat that frequently you're using infrared light. And even though the light only excites the fluorophore at the, at the very narrowest point, you're still heating the specimen above and below that, that point. 
and I'm not going to show you the gruesome movie of, of uh, zebrafish uh, photoreceptors exploding when they were when the cytoplasm boiled while I was trying to image them, but um, it was gruesome. So how can we take a bunch of the, the good qualities from all of those different microscopes and combine them into a microscope that's perfect for live imaging? And um, I will present this, the light sheet microscope as the perfect solution. So the light sheet microscope is, I didn't invent this, Nobody in my lab invented this. Um, so this was uh, published in 1903, the first example of the light sheet microscope. And the idea of the light sheet microscope is that the detection arm and the illumination arm are at right angles to each other. And the light, the illumination light um, passes through, is formed into a sheet and passes through the specimen right at the focal plane of the objective. So the detection arm is looking at this plane of the sample. And so you illuminate the entire plane all at once. And so you get the same optical sectioning capabilities of a confocal microscope, but you're not illuminating the whole specimen when you don't need to. You're only illuminating the specimen that you, or the part of the specimen, only the plane that you're, you're imaging. And you can image the entire plane in one shot, just one exposure. So it can be very, very fast. So in our case, this is the way it works. Um, we have a sample that in usually is some iteration of this, where the sample is embedded in a cylinder of agarose um, and uh, pushed out of a glass capillary where it, it holds the agros. So you only image through the agros, you don't image through the glass. And then the light sheet is formed by lenses that pass, that um, create this light sheet that passes through the specimen at a right angle to the detection lens. You can buy one of these, um, there are several, several different commercial models. This is the one probably people are most familiar with, the Zeiss light sheet C1. Um, but the microscope that I use, the SimView microscope is a little bit different and it has two detection objectives. Conventionally, light sheet microscopes have one detection objective. So there's a near side and a far side to your specimen. So you can't get full coverage of the whole specimen. Um, the back half, you can't see. Um, in the SimView microscope, we have, um, it's illuminated from both, from two sides. There are two, detect, two illumination objectives that send light sheets from both sides. So there's no dark side to the specimen. Even if the light sheet is blocked by something in the specimen, it's also illuminated from the other side. And uh, it's, um, there are detection objectives on both sides. So you see you have a front view and a, and a back view simultaneously. And photo bleaching is greatly reduced. So instead of having wide field illumination that, it, that illuminates the entire specimen the whole time, or confocal, which in, uh, illuminates the entire specimen many, many times, the light sheet microscope only illuminates the, sh the, the plane that you're imaging. So if you look at the intensity of the, the signal, um, in a light sheet microscope here in green, it's much different than the intensity of the signal in a, in a confocal microscope um, where you've imaged it many, many times, illuminated it many, many times and caused all this photo bleaching. And you can see that in these images, the difference in, in uh, the photo bleaching from a light sheet microscope where the images look good even after repeated imaging and the confocal image, which which gets dimmer and dimmer as you image it. This is what the SimView microscope looks like. There are actually two microscopes here. There's one here on this uh, air table and one here on the back second air table. And this is what they look like with mood lighting. Um, and the SimView microscope, uh, 
like I said, it has two detection objectives that are both focused on the same plane. So you get two views, a front view and a back view of each plane and uh, two illumination objectives. So you have a continuous light sheet. It's not really a sheet of light. It's a, uh, a pencil laser beam that's scanned up and down very rapidly. Um, and all of these, these things are coplanar. So the, the illumination sheet and the detection objectives, the focal plane of the detection objectives are all aligned so that uh, you're imaging simultaneously the same plane from two different sides and illuminating the same plane from two different sides. And in the normal configuration, what we do is hold all these things steady and then move the sample through the through the light sheet. We, uh, you move the specimen into the light sheet, take an image, move it a couple microns, take another image, move the sample, take another, another image, and so on. Um, but it's, it's pretty quick. Um, you know, typically we have exposure times of like 10 milliseconds. So 10 milliseconds per plane. Um, so you can get through a fairly thick specimen, uh, you know, quite quickly. So you can get images like this. So this is a Drosophila embryo de developing um, for 24 hours. And so this is the front view and back view, kind of the dorsal view and ventral view of the same specimen. And what you see are the nuclei. This is uh, an RFP, red fluorescent protein label of, the nu of uh, histone in the nucleus. And uh, it's imaged the, at 30 second intervals. So every 30 seconds, you get an entire volume of the whole specimen. Um, and it turns out to be a huge amount of data, which is, this is like 1.7 million images, um, 13 terabytes of data in this one movie. So that's a whole challenge, another uh, challenge dealing with all that data that we'll save for another time. But the resolution is good enough that um, you can track these individual nuclei um, and we have an automated uh, tracking system called TGMM. Uh, it's freely available on our website if you want to if you want to try it. Uh, and so you can track nuclei throughout development and kind of map cell fates automatically. And these spare, these specimens um, survive quite well. Uh, there's very little photo bleaching, very little phototoxicity. This is when the specimen or the experiment ends is when the, the embryo hatches and the larva crawls away, which is a, kind of a, a good end point for uh, assuring that your, your specimen was healthy throughout, throughout the uh, experiment. What I use the, the SimView microscope for is to, uh, studying the development of the nervous system. Um, so we have the ability, you know, there we have a variety of filter wheels and lasers in these microscopes. So we can do multicolor imaging. So uh, having a multicolor, uh, a multi-labeled um, specimen uh, like this allows you to separate individual cells and their, um, their identities. So uh, on the left is every nucleus in the, in this, in the animal is labeled. And on the right, this is the, the cytoplasm that's carrying a, uh, of cytoplasm of, of neuroblast that's carrying a GFP label. So you can see the development of the entire nervous system. And then late, late in, this, in the, uh, the recording, the animal begins to move and eventually it will crawl out of the field of view. I think, yes, it, if we wait for it. It's a 24 hour long recording, so sometimes you have to wait. There it goes. So you can get uh, um, pretty good images of development of the entire nervous system. Um, and you get complete coverage, front and back. 
you know, it's, it's not a giant specimen, but it's fairly large as microscopic specimens go. It's, uh, it's about 200 microns wide and about 600 microns from top to bottom and about 200 microns thick. Um, and we have, you know, excellent X, Y, and Z resolution and good temporal resolution throughout the whole recording. One thing that our, the SIMFU microscopes can do that uh, the commercial microscopes can't do is very fast recordings. So we're not, uh, we have the ability to make these detection objectives move. They sit on, on piezo stages. They don't have a huge range, about 250 microns, but they move very quickly. So instead of moving the sample, we can hold the sample stationary and move this objective very quickly and move the light sheet so that in coordination with the detection objectives. So we're moving the focal plane through this sample uh, quickly um, and holding the samples stationary. What this allows us to do is to image uh, things like calcium indicators. So this is uh, a zebrafish larval brain with uh, labeled with uh, uh, G camp, and what you see are the calcium transients, the kind of the uh, neural activity throughout this brain um, as animal um, is probably trying to get out of its little agarose prison. You know, don't really know what it's thinking, but we can um, we can see all the calcium activity. So this is one one zebrafish brain, and you, this is the dorsal view, lateral view, and the frontal view of the same brain. And this was imaged at four hertz, so we have a complete volume of the whole brain four times a second. And similar images from, this is a Drosophila, central nervous system uh, of the larva, um, and this was at five hertz, imaged at five hertz, and um, you can see these waves of motor activity that pass through this uh, ventral nerve cord, this part of the, the central nervous system of the, of the larva that correspond to um, waves of muscle activity that make the animal crawl forward or backward. Again, it's probably trying to escape from, from the microscope. But this, it's fast enough and gentle enough that we can image for many, many hours. So this is uh, 10 hours of imaging in, uh, in a, a zebra or a Drosophila embryo, just the last 10 hours of development. And you can see the onset of neural activity um, from these G-CAMP signals on, in stage 16 and then there's more signals as the animal gets older. Um, and then late in development, you start to see these coordinated waves of activity that proceed up and down the, the, the nervous system. And then eventually the animal gets coordinated enough that it can crawl out of the field of view. Um, <clears throat> something else that we're able to do is control the, the, the incubation um, environment that uh, these animals are in. So for zebrafish and drosophila, it's really easy. The recording chamber is just filled with water. Um, but if you want to record something more delicate, like a mouse embryo, uh, we have to control the gas concentration and the temperature and uh, make sure that this specimen is sterile. So we built this little box of the mouse house around the, uh, the recording chamber uh, keeps a five percent CO two uh, concentration in the in the in the air in here and also in the incubation medium and um, there's a nutritive incubation medium around the the specimen and um, Kate McDowell in our lab has imaged. Uh, mouse development for about 48 hours in in this specimen uh, or in the setup 
and you can see the developing mouse embryo, the, um, the uh, development of the anal pore and the primitive streak. This is the developing central nervous system. Um, and we get full coverage. You can see every, every cell. So this is a, a ubiquitous nuclear label. Every cell is labeled. Um, and you get full coverage. Here's the you know, ventral view, frontal view, lateral view of the same specimen. And it gave Kate the ability to do this uh, kind of statistical fate map where, um, so this is the average embryo of many different embryos um, that have been averaged together. And she has annotated the, the cell fates of, of each of these nuclei and then you can track them backwards to where they started in the embryo. Um, <clears throat> so any one of these long recordings like that, like that 48 hour long mouse recording or de the developing nervous system of, of either a, a fish or a fly, one of the things you have to worry about is that during development, the, uh, the optical qualities of the specimen change. So there's, to begin with, there's some optical heterogeneity of the sample and some, some optical problems in the environment. You know, they're, you're passing a light sheet through a sample that's held in an agarose cylinder or sometimes in a little Teflon tube. Um, and to get a good image throughout development, you have to keep that light sheet perfectly aligned with the focal plane of the objectives. And that will change as the animal, well, in different parts of the animal, and as the animal changes during development. So if you're passing light sheet through a cylindrical specimen like this, the light sheets will bend as they hit this, the outside of the specimen. And also, the detection planes will be bent by the cylindrical shape of the, of the specimen. And in no case do the light sheets and the, the focal planes of the detection objectives correspond. They have to be adjusted at each, at each plane. So it's kind of a, it could be a kind of a tedious thing to do is to change the angle and change the location of, of the light sheet for each focal plane as you pass through your specimen. Uh, so we developed a, uh, an autopilot system. So this is uh, adaptive imaging, the light sheet um, alignment changes as the specimen changes and um, it cha it's different in different portions of the specimen. So this is a zebrafish embryo. Um, and what you see here on the right are uh, this images of the same field of view of or the same ROI of um, that has been corrected using our autopilot pro program or not corrected where we just took the, an, an image of the same ROI and didn't turn on the correction. And you can see that if we use this autopilot, this automatic adaptive imaging, um, image quality is much better. You know, we don't see things that are images that are really out of focus. And it works really well, especially for specimens like this Drosophila embryo, where what I'm interested in is the developing nervous system. And at the beginning of the imaging, there is no nervous system. So there's really nothing to focus on. And you have to wait for the nervous system to develop and this fluorescent protein to start being expressed. Um, and you don't want to interrupt the, the recording. So the, uh, the autopilot assesses the image quality during the recording and adjusts the light sheets accordingly. So you get a uh, image that's in focus from the very beginning and stays in focus throughout the whole, uh, throughout the whole recording. So you can get uh, some really nice recordings of 
like this developing nervous system and the development of activity in the nervous system. In the, the, the symbio microscope, it's, it's so gentle on the specimens. It uses such low light. You're only illuminating the light, the, the plane that you're imaging that you can, for, for many hours at a time, get, uh, get really good images that uh, remain in focus and have high spatial and temporal resolution without damaging your specimen. Um, we've used it on a few other specimens too. This is a crustacean called periali, um, which is a little shrimp-like thing, which is interesting because um, unlike insects, it develop, the limbs develop in the, the embryo. So you can, you can see limb develop, embryonic limb, de limb development. Or this is a pygmy squid. Um, why is this movie not playing? No, uh, that's supposed to be a movie on the bottom. Anyway, it's a movie of the heart. You can see the heart in the in the squid here. Um, and I don't know why that movie isn't playing, but um, this is the four chambered heart of the pygmy squid, which should be beating. Oh, there it goes. It's beating. So the advantages of the SIMPU microscope, it's fast wide field image acquisition. You image a whole specimen all at once. Everything is in focus. You have excellent 3D information. There's high signal to noise ratio. Um, it's we have better signal to noise ratio than confocal microscopy because uh, although we image, um, uh, kind of like take an entire image of the of this of one plane in like 10 milliseconds, that's a thousand times fast, thousand times more integration time for for counting photons than you get with a confocal microscope. So we get much higher signal to noise ratio um, and much lower photo bleaching and phototoxicity. Disadvantages are that it's complicated sample preparation. You have to have your sample prepared in such a way that you have optical access from four different directions. You're also unable to really do anything uh, to manipulate your specimen during the, the recording. So um, it has to be labeled with, um, with genetically encoded fluorescent proteins. Transgenic animals are the only kind of animals that we can, that we can image. You can't really use fluorescent dyes because there's no way to wash them out of the of your sample, and um, you can't use uh, uh, antibodies for the same reason. You can't you can't wash things out in and out of the the living specimen. We also have the disadvantage that in some cases we have anisotropic voxels. The Z resolution of the same view microscope is not a diffraction limited. It's limited by the thickness of the light sheet. So we can get thicknesses of about two microns. That's easy to get. Um, but to get a, a smaller Z resolution than, than two microns is, is difficult, especially for large samples. So when, you, when would you use a, a SimView microscope? Well, you have to trade off these different things in the, the, the pyramid of frustration. You can have some of these, but not all, you can optimize some of these qualities, but not all of them. So if you want a long time lapse, minutes, hours, and days, use a SimView microscope. Uh, if you need good temporal resolution, like down to milliseconds, this is a good, good scope to choose. If you have a large sample, this is a good scope to choose too. Um, we can handle up to about right now to about three milli millimeter thick specimens. It's limited on just by the working distance of the, the detection objectives. Although we're building a microscope that's going to take much bigger samples that will hopefully be able to image a entire mouse brain in just one shot. Um, you don't need super high spatial resolution. Um, 
if, if you do need super high spatial resolution, don't use the SimView microscope. And the Z resolution is determined by the thickness of the light sheet, not by the optics of the detection system. And your specimen has to be transgenic. It has to have fluorescent proteins or uh, chemigenetic labels. I didn't show you any of those, but uh, you can use chemigenetic labels um, as long as they're you know, fluorogenic. Um, and I'd glad to talk, be glad to talk to some of you about those. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Bill, for the beautiful and the lovely talk, the lovely embryos. Uh, so right now, so uh, okay. we are getting to Q and A section. So anyone has question can unmute yourself and uh, speak up. So we already have five questions in the chat window. So three of them from Steve as the promote question. So I will read to you and so if, if you can answer one by one. So the first one is, will photo bleaching lead to phototoxicity? Um, by necessity, yes. Uh, so the photo bleaching is caused by, you know, you, you put more energy into your sample than you get out. The energy has to go someplace and it can uh, cause transform, uh, transformation of the, the fluorophores in your specimen. Um, and it's also going to cause the, the creation of reaction ox reactive oxidative species. And that's gonna cause phototoxicity. There's really no way to, to avoid it. If you're, if you're photo bleaching your specimen, you're also causing phototoxicity. Uh, the only way to avoid it is to reduce your photon budget, have less light in. Great. So the second question is, how can one tell phototoxicity in an embryo before its end point? Um, so anybody that's worked with embryos uh, knows that sometimes embryos explode. So, I mean, that's, that's a sure telltale if your embryo explodes. But um, what you typically see is kind of abnormal cell uh, structure. Um, like I showed you those pictures of the cells with uh, blebs in the, in the plasma membrane. And that's the kind of thing that you're looking for is cells that are abnormally shaped. Uh, Phototoxicity has a really bad effect on plasma membranes, it causes cross-linking in the phospholipids in the plasma membrane, and they become uh, less fluid and uh, tend to rupture or um, produce these blebs or spikes. So look at cell shape, that's the way to tell. Cool. So is there a 2P same view? If so, will it require less adaptive focusing? There is a 2P um, uh, same view microscope. Um, and we've actually published some images from, there's a 2015 paper, uh, Nature Communications paper on um, the Drosophila central nervous system that has 2P images in it. And um, it turns out not to be a huge advantage for a light sheet microscope because what the two photon microscope or what uh, two photon illumination does is it, it, it um, you know, it only produces enough energy density to excite the fluorophores in a narrow, in a narrow um, point or you know where the the focus of the, the illumination is small is tightest, and in the light sheet configuration, what that means is that you get a narrow strip down the center of your your specimen that is um, where you excite the fluorophores, and to the right or left of that image or of that that strip, um, you don't have enough energy density to to excite the fluorophores. So in order to uh, illuminate the entire specimen, not only do you have to sweep your 
your laser up and down, but you have to change the point of focus left and right, which ends up taking a long time. Um, so it's not worth it to do two photon illumination with a light sheet microscope, but it's, or with the SimView microscope like this, but uh, if, you, if you were going to use it, you would still have to do the adaptive focusing uh, because although there's going to be less scattering and less uh, refraction caused by the sample, you're still going to have some, uh, and especially in the detection path, you're going to have some refraction and you're going to have to account for that with, by changing the, the, the um, illumination path. Thank you. So I can see um, one more questions in the chat window. So once again, please feel free to unmute yourself to interact with Bill. So uh, the next question is from LB. So I will read this one. So from now on, just feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, have you tried using SimView with fixed tissue imaging? Yeah, we have. Um, and Oh, I should have showed you some of that. So um, yeah, we have uh, in a number of cases, either just fixed tissue or expanded um, samples that uh, uh, we get um, good images. Uh, and one of the advantages of the, those, uh, those kind of samples is that we can, we can image very large samples, like up to easily three millimeters um, depending upon the, the objectives that we use, we can, we can even do five millimeters. Um, uh, so a sample that's, you know, a five millimeter cube is not hard for us to, to image. Um, it, but it does take, it's, it's a, this is a very low throughput machine. Um, so if you're just going to do, uh, if you want to screen a bunch of, fixed samples for expression or something like that, then this is not the machine to use. Um, you know, it takes, it takes uh, hours to set up one sample. Um, and uh, it may not be worth it if you're, if you can image uh, your fixed samples with some other method. But if you have a very large sample, uh, this is uh, a good way to image it. Cool. So one, one question from Daniel, is the adaptive focusing affected by inhomogeneous distribution of fluorescence? Um, that's a good question. It, it may be, um, you know, we don't really, we don't really worry about what the cause of the inhomogeneity in the sample is. We just correct for all optical aberrations that we can. And uh, so, yeah, who, who knows where, where the, the, the aberrations come from? I, prim I suspect primarily lipids in your sample. Um, probably it's, lipids are more important than the, than the fluorescent label. But um, yeah, just don't pay attention to the source. Correct for everything. <laughs> okay, so that that's that's a very cool question. So, Bill, if you could have one wish come true tomorrow, which will be the first thing you will have a new SimView microscope be able to do? Um, well, I'll I'll tell you things that I'm trying to do right now is um, one is to have two color imaging of of calcium indicators. So you can put a red calcium indicator in one cell type and a green calcium indicator in another cell type and image those at, you know, at five hertz or 10 hertz. Um, and uh, so have, so you can see, you know, co coordination of neural activity between two different populations of neurons or between neurons and muscles or something like that. Uh, we have several ideas. And, um, and also to use uh, longer wavelengths. So 
you get less scattering, less refraction with and uh, less absorption of the illumination light with longer wavelengths. So if we could push everything farther red, you know, 700, 800, 900 nanometers, then that would be ideal. And those are, those are things that we have plans to do. Uh, but yeah, you know, Thank progress you. is slow. Thank you, Bill. That was, that was me. Can I follow up just real quick? Oh, it's Isabel. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you were talking about then farther wavelengths. Would that mean like combining halo tags with other tags, like snap tag? I don't know. Are you trying any of those? Yeah. So uh, in fact, a couple of the images I showed you had snap tag or halo tag, uh, halo tag labeling in them. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm making flies, for instance, that have the ability to label both halo and snap simultaneously. So we can use uh, longer wavelength uh, dyes, but um, we're kind of limited right now by the availability of the longer wavelength dyes. They have to be fluorogenic, which means that um, when they're unbound, they have to be dark and uh, so there seems to be some limitations in the ability to have long wavelength fluorogenic dyes. Um, so right now, the longest wavelength good fluorogenic dye we have is this uh, JF635, um, which works really well, but I would like to have longer wavelength dyes. Thank you very much. I think Michael's got a question. Hi, yes. Hi, Bill. Uh, thanks for the talk. I, I just wanted to ask, um, this might be overcomplicating things, but the autopilot seems to affect, um, you know, the illumination side of things. Is there any benefit to adaptive optics in the, in the detection side to imp improve the quality? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and we really... So Chen should really answer this question since she's building an adaptive optic light uh, SimView microscope that uh, is going to do just that. Okay. And uh, I believe it does it without a guide star. Is that right, Chen? Uh, I, yes, so that's the plan. So we can do with guide star or without guide star. So without, if we are not going to use guide star, we will use uh, image correlation. To, to measure the aberration in the sample. Cool. That's yeah. That's that sounds quite exciting. And then uh, another question would be: Is there any benefit to using a potentially a Bessel beam or changing the beam somewhat, if possible? So we have we have the ability to use Bessel beam in in one of our microscopes, and um, it turns out to be. Uh, N not advantageous. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about the Bessel beam is that it's self-healing so that you don't have to worry about uh, uh, absorption in your sample. But, um, and it's, you know, it's, you can make it thin and long. So those are advantages, but um, we are unable to suppress the side lobes in, in the Bessel beam. So what you get is uh, several planes illuminated at one time. You get kind of these secondary planes in front of and behind the, the, pl the plane that you want illuminated. So it, it just increases the background. Um, you know, this is a very simple machine and the simpler we keep it, the better the images are. So adding Bessel beams, adding two photons, does not improve image quality. Okay, cool, thank you, Bill. So Enrique has two questions, Enrique. Yeah, so, uh, uh, but that's actually, it's just maybe briefly to, uh, to what you said right now. Like, I think in the mosaic, they actually also incorporate a two photon vessel. Maybe, maybe they, I, I don't know which strategy they used in order to lower the cyclopes, but if you have a two photon, this should automatically actually be be a little bit lower, but maybe we can also internally within Janelia talk about 
this option as well. But my questions were actually for uh, uh, two other points. So you were actually showing samples right now um, where the sample was developing over time, but it was actually quite stationary. And um, so, my, so my first question is more or less um, uh, if the scopes are also adjusted in order to, to do tracking of organisms and of um, samples. Um, so that's the first part, so meaning if it, if it moves that you can actually still kind of do the imaging, um, but while it's moving. And my second question would be, you were also showing right now, we still have it on the screen, uh, the neuronal, uh, the the signals of the neurons by culture, uh, uh, calcium imaging, but you were also saying that uh, these signals were created mm -hmm. because maybe the um, the sample wants to move away. So so um, I was actually wondering uh, whether it's also planned in future to have very specific behavioral studies where the the organism feels quite up in the natural environment, and you maybe give a stimulus from the outside in order to actually really measure what the response of the animal is to a specific trigger and not just uh, like right now, the response, ah, oh, maybe it tries to escape and that's why we see the, uh, the signaling there to have, uh, as I said, very specific triggered behavioral studies, which then also might require to maybe not embed the sample into agarose or to, um, how can I say, have a more um, lifestyle imaging in a very natural environment. So yeah, so two-parted question, tracking and then uh, the behavioral part. So the, the first part, tracking, yeah, we do have the ability to track uh, specimens and that was very important for the mouse development studies that Kate did um, because those, because those uh, embryos grow so much during development, they couldn't be confined in any agros or anything. And they just had to be basically floating in free culture. And um, so they had to, uh, the tracking of the specimen was very important. So we have the ability to do that, track, track um, uh, edges or the center of mass of your, your image and uh, um, this and have the stages adjust for it. Um, so it keeps the specimen in the, in the center of the field of view, provided it doesn't move too fast. Um, so if you have like a a zebra fish that's going to swim or try to swim, it will move too fast for this, for our microscope to keep up with it. Um, so it works well if, for things that are for growing or kind of drifting through your, through the, the field of view, but not actively moving. Um, and um, we also have the ability to computationally correct for that movement later. Um, so we can register those images later, which we do frequently. Um, and for the kind of more naturalistic recordings, you should really talk to the people in Misha Aaron's lab, as they are doing exactly that. So they have uh, zebrafish in a light sheet scope that's similar to this, that um, they're held in such a way that like their tails can move so they can see if the fish is trying to swim or not. And they can also put electrodes in, into muscles in the, in the tail to see exactly when the fish is trying to swim and when it's not trying to swim. And they also have a little video screen where they can show the, the zebrafish, you know, moving bars or some sort of naturalistic uh, sensory input, and um, and that's exactly what they're trying to do: is to trying to correlate the imaged calcium activity with uh, with identifiable behaviors. That's interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. There are one more question from Tianan. So is Tianan there? Would you like to raise? Can you the unmute, Tianan. Yeah. Okay, I will read the question. So, okay. so how well can linear piezo objective lens movement compensate for curved focal plane? So it doesn't really can, uh, help much for the curved focal plane. Um, yeah, we don't have the ability to do that. Um, the curved focal plane is just something that we have to, to live with. Um, but again, we have one of the 
one of the kind of disadvantages of, of this scope is uh, also turns out to be an advantage in that respect. Uh, you know, we don't have good Z resolution. We, uh, the, the Z resolution of the scope is determined by the thickness of the light sheet. So if the curvature of the focal plane is smaller than the, the thickness of the light sheet, we don't lose any information. Um, we, we still see uh, everything that's in the illuminated plant or illuminated slice of our, our specimen, even though um, uh, the, the focal plane is curved. And it helps a little bit to use uh, objectives that have a relatively low NA so that uh, we have a little, little uh, greater depth of field. So we typically don't use um, detection objectives that have a NA greater than 1.0. So we, uh, um, a small curvature in the, the focal plane is not, uh, doesn't really ruin our images. Oh, so that's the last question. So um, yeah. does, does anyone has more questions? I just had one question from, from Australia's side. Um, <laughs> it's beautiful. How can we use it uh, from here? Is it remotely accessible? <clears throat> okay, so there's, <laughs> yeah. so there's uh, there's there's two, two ways you can do it. Um, there's the hard way and the easy way. The hard way is that um, all of the the plans and the software and everything that you need to make your own SimView microscope is available on at the Genelia website. You can download all the AutoCAD drawings and everything you need to build your own microscope, um, parts lists and everything. Um, and a number of people have done just that kind of successfully. Um, and the easy way is to contact um, Ulrika and Mike Reiki, who is on this uh, Zoom here. They have one of these microscopes and they, um, Mike will run it for you. You don't even have to learn how to use it. And uh, all you have to do is submit a proposal to the Advanced Imaging Center at Genelia and um, somehow get yourself here and they will do the imaging for you on the SimView microscope. Um, all your expenses are paid for once you get here. Uh, so we have, we have housing meals um, and all the research costs are paid by HHMI. Um, so yeah, check on the, on the Genelia Advanced Imaging Center uh, website and you can submit a proposal and, and uh, use the SimView microscope. Cool. Yeah. yeah, okay. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. So we will post today's video on YouTube channel. So if Bill don't mind, so we will put his email at the end of the video. If you have more questions, you can contact him directly and also welcome to contact me and Steve for more questions about this series. So for now, then see everyone next talk in next talk yeah um thanks everyone yeah oh. yeah have a bye. nice day bye <laughs>